Hello and welcome to this A-level chemistry exam question walkthrough where we're going to take a look at an 11 mark question from the Born Harbour Cycles topic in thermodynamics. Feel free to download a copy of the question from the description, have a go at it yourself and see how you get on by watching this video. I'll do lots of annotations for the thinking behind the question in blue and what will get you the actual marks will be written in purple. This question is about enthalpy changes for calcium chloride and magnesium chloride. Part A. State the meaning of the term enthalpy change. So enthalpy change is defined as being the heat energy change at constant pressure. But for a one mark question like this, you could probably drop the word energy. But what's really crucial is the word heat and constant pressure. The figure shows an incomplete born harbour cycle for the formation of calcium chloride. For three marks, we need to complete the figure above by writing the formulas, including state symbols, of the appropriate species of each of the three blank lines. So a born harbour cycle shows how elements are converted into an ionic compound. And we always have our final goal on the bottom line as one mole of a particular ionic compound, in this case calcium chloride. And so in general, what we have is on this line, we always have the elements that make up the ionic compound. And so that means the elements calcium and chlorine. They need to be in their standard states and they need to be in a particular multiple in order to match this one mole of ionic compound. So actually that's quite nice and easy here because we just need one calcium solid and one Cl2 gas. And we can sort of take our lead from the line above, but it does need to be changed slightly. So calcium solid, chlorine gas. And so then this arrow, which is going upwards, that means this is an endothermic change, whereas the one going down was exothermic. This arrow, where we're changing our calcium solid into calcium gas, that is the enthalpy of atomization of calcium. And you'll notice that the chlorine, Cl2, hasn't changed. And that's one of the rules here for born harbour cycles. You only change one thing at a time, so you can isolate the particular enthalpy change that is occurring. And then we can see for the next line up, also endothermic, that the calcium gas is becoming calcium 1 plus gaseous with an electron. So that means that this reaction was the first ionization energy of calcium because we've taken a mole of gaseous atoms and we've turned it into a mole of singly positive gaseous ions and also taken that mole of electrons away. Then we've got another blank here, and in order to work out what's going on, we could take our lead from the very top line here. And so we've got calcium single positive gas on this line. Up here on the top line, we've got calcium two plus gas. And so here we could put in, and this is probably the best thing to do, calcium two plus gas. And what we've done to make that change occur is we've taken another mole of electrons. This time we're taking it away from the singly positive ions. So now we've got a total of two electrons on this line. And so again, we haven't actually changed the chlorine. The chlorine has remained constant through each of these first three changes. And then on the top line, you can see that what's happened is the chlorine, which hasn't changed yet, has now atomized. Now it's atomized and produced two moles of chlorine gas. And so that means that we're actually atomizing two moles of chlorine because the definition of enthalpy of atomization is when you make one mole of a gaseous atom. And so we're making two. So this arrow here is representing two lots of the uh, atomization of chlorine. As an aside, this line could actually also have been the atomization of chlorine first. And if that had been the case, you could have not touched the calcium at all and atomized the chlorine at this stage and put 2Cl gas on this line, as I'm showing down at the bottom. That's an alternative for this row here, but it doesn't matter which you put in. And then the second to last arrow and the last mark that we're getting is going down from the top to here. Now, what's happened here is the chlorine atoms in the gaseous form have gained a mole of electrons each. 
And so this is the electron affinity of chlorine. By definition, one mole of chlorine gas gains one mole of electrons. And so this arrow is again symbolizing two lots of the enthalpy of atom electron affinity for chlorine. And then last of all, we've got gaseous ions on this line and we've got the ionic compound down here. So this is the lattice enthalpy, this arrow. Now, since the arrow is pointing upwards, it is the lattice dissociation enthalpy. If it was pointing downwards, the lattice formation enthalpy. I've gone into a lot more detail here than you needed to for the three marks, perhaps, but it will help us in the question that's coming up next. Table one shows some enthalpy data. And so you can see that all of those changes that I was talking about in the previous question are now being given some numerical values here. And our command is to use the figure in part A and the data in table one to calculate a value for the enthalpy of lattice dissociation of calcium chloride. There are two ways to answer a question like this. The first way is to add all of these values from the data table to your born harbour cycle that you were looking at in the previous question. So we've got the enthalpy of formation, minus 795. That will go here. The enthalpy of atomization of calcium should be added in next. Then the first ionization energy, then the second ionization energy, then two lots of the atomization of chlorine, don't forget. So that's 121 multiplied by two, and then two lots of the electron affinity of chlorine. So minus 364 multiplied by two. And then you're trying to work out what the value for this arrow is. So starting here and finishing at the top of the arrow. And so when you use a born harbor cycle in this way, what you do is you move the other way around to end up at the same place. So the key thing is that we start on this line and we finish on this line. So what we end up doing is we end up going up here. So we're going against that first arrow. So that is minus minus 795, so plus 795. Then we're going with this arrow and this one and this one and this one and this one. And so we end up with a total for the lattice dissociation enthalpy by summing all of these numbers and we get 2,242. The alternative method that you could use is one that relies on you remembering that the enthalpy of formation is equal to the sum of all of the other enthalpy changes in this cycle. So going from here down to here is equivalent to going all the way around the rest of the cycle. So in other words, enthalpy of formation is equal to the sum of all of the other enthalpy changes. This method relies on the lattice enthalpy being enthalpy of lattice formation. And so what that means is, since we're being required to calculate the lattice dissociation enthalpy, the value that we get will be a negative one when we use this memory aid of minus 2242. And we need to flip that sign to be the positive one because dissociation is always a positive enthalpy change. So we could run the numbers faster probably than using a born harbour cycle, but we do need to remember that the lattice dissociation must always be a positive number. Magnesium chloride dissolves in water. Give an equation, including state symbols, to represent the process that occurs when the enthalpy change of solution of magnesium chloride is measured. So they've done a quick switch here between talking about calcium chloride to magnesium chloride, so we need to not fall into that trap of sticking with calcium. So whenever you dissolve anything, you take the solid ionic compound, one mole of it, and it turns into the aqueous ions that that ionic compound is comprised of. So magnesium chloride is MgCl2, and so the ions that make that up will be Mg2+, plus aqueous, and 2Cl- minus aqueous. And so that would probably be the best thing to write for our answer. We could recognise that this dissolving is likely to be an equilibrium, but you don't need to do that. And equally, you could, if you wish, include the AQ symbol on the left-hand side to show the sort of the active dissolving that the solvent is carrying out. But again, not necessary. And what I've put on the actual answer line is my preferred answer. Table two shows some enthalpy data. 
you can see that what we've got is we've got three enthalpy changes all associated with an enthalpy of solution. We've got the lattice dissociation enthalpy of magnesium chloride. Again, notice that that's a positive value. And then we've got two enthalpy of hydration values, one for magnesium gas, which is negative, and another for chloride gas, which is also negative. So hydration is an exothermic process. When you're working with enthalpy of solution, you can actually construct this like a mini born harbour cycle. And it only ever has three steps. You always start with your ionic compound on one line. So that, remember, is a giant 3D ionic lattice of alternating positive and negative ions, strongly held together by electrostatic attraction. Then we've got the lattice dissociation enthalpy, which is where those attractions are broken and the ions are turned into gas. And so this top line is gaseous ions. And then what you've got is this arrow pointing downwards, this exothermic reaction, which is the hydration of all of these gaseous ions that have been produced. So this is the sum of each individual hydration and where there are more than one ion, in the case of the chloride ion, we need to double that hydration or any other multiple as appropriate. So this is the sum of the hydration values. And so this other arrow on the left, this is the actual enthalpy of solution, where we dissolve our magnesium chloride to make the aqueous ions, and it's the same aqueous ions that we produce when we hydrate the gaseous ions. And so you can see from this born harbour cycle that this enthalpy of solution is equal to the enthalpy of lattice dissociation plus the sum of all of those hydrations. So I've drawn this picture to help us understand it, not because it's vital for this mark, because in part E, we're being asked to use our answer from part D on the previous page to calculate a value for the enthalpy of solution of magnesium chloride. And so the answer to part D was just the equation that allowed us to say that magnesium chloride was turning into aqueous ions. What's really important for this question is that we remember what I said about the memory aid, that the enthalpy of solution is equal to the sum of all of the others. So we need to take the 2493 for the lattice dissociation enthalpy, add to it the minus 1920 for the hydration of magnesium and add to that minus 364 multiplied by 2 and then we get an enthalpy of solution of minus 155 kilojoules per mole. If you forgot to multiply the hydration of chloride by 2 you would still get one of these two marks. In F we're told that the enthalpy of hydration of calcium is minus 1650 we're being asked to suggest why this value is less exothermic than magnesium has for its enthalpy of hydration. And so we're comparing calcium to magnesium. And so when an ion is hydrated, what happens is an attraction forms between the ion and either the hydrogen of the water or the oxygen of the water. Now, since magnesium and calcium are both positive ions, it's an attraction to the electron-rich oxygen in the water. And so what we need to do here is compare the sizes of calcium and magnesium. Now, calcium is a bigger ion and it has the same charge. And so what you could say is you could say it's a bigger ion or you could say it's got a lower charge to size ratio compared to magnesium 2 plus or it's got a lower charge density. And so as a result of any one of those three things that we mention in M1, we can say that there is therefore a weaker attraction between the ion and the electron-rich oxygen in water. OK, that's the end of this question and the end of this video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.